I'm Mike Lewis. I'm the uh, Chief Technology Officer of NanoRex, uh, Exo Holdings, Exo Airlock, all that jazz. Um, Jeff couldn't make it today, sends his apologies. Uh, it's actually uh, kind of a nice opportunity to talk about Jeff. Um, you know, <laughs> very often he gets up here and he talks, you know, he's a visionary, he's, a, you know, he's the CEO of, of NanoRex, but he's, he's got this history of commercial space. You know, he, uh, he's given credit for many of the key breakthroughs in just space progress and commercialization, things like that. Um, you know, he, we give him credit for the, uh, the commercialization of space assets, um, the integration of the Russian Space Agency with the US agency, uh, it, the major space programs, he got them talking. And he was officially the, uh, the only American to be a part of, it was RSC Energia. Um, that, I bring that up today because it's, uh, it, it, it's kind of relevant. Um, those conversations early on, uh, they, they brought together different groups. You know, they brought they brought NASA and the uh, the Russian program together, and uh, it, those discussions led to a lot of different things, including a, a real focus on safety. And uh, we saw that today. Uh, one of the one of the effects of those discussions was that the uh, back in the day, the Clinton administration uh, agreed to raise the orbital inclination of the space station so that it could be accessed by uh, by Russian vehicles. And uh, you know, we saw that. So. Today, you know, uh, 56S, thank goodness, worked well, but, uh, but it's just relevant. So uh, more about Jeff in a sec. Uh, first, let's talk about Nanoracks. Um, make sure I'm pushing the right button. So I have uh, 23 slides, including that one and this one, uh, three videos. One of them probably won't work. I'll try to keep it uh, upbeat because of the, the wonderful time slot after lunch. Um, and uh, at the end, there'll be time for questions. So. What I want you to keep an eye out for, I have one super over the top statement in here. And uh, you know, whoever points it out, I'll give an anorak sticker to or something. So, um, so Nanorax, we envision a future in space uh, where commercial space stations uh, and habitats populate the solar system, right? Uh, right now, this is a carefully worded sentence, we're the only commercial space station company with existing customers and a pathway to be operating in space uh, over the next five years with realistic price points. So, uh, we, we, we're all over the place if you look at our, uh, if you look at our portfolio. We have platforms that I'm going to go into the, on the inside of the space station. We have them on the outside of the space station. We deploy satellites. We're, uh, we're, we're doing a lot of things with Blue, Blue Origin. Uh, lots of great things. Looks scattered, but really our ultimate goal here is to build new space stations, to have private space stations. So, uh, about us, we were founded in 2009. Uh, many of you know this. Uh, yeah, really, the premise was, was let's, let's use this space station, right? Let's use it for education, let's use it for research, let's use it for scientific advancement. Um, we found out that it was a good place to do business. So uh, there'll be a recurring theme that, I, that you'll hear from me. Then we, uh, we, we see the space station and the other platforms in space as being a place to do business. So, uh, we, uh, we like to take credit for uh, democratizing space. Uh, really, we're just, we're just providing commercial access. Um, and, and I'll show you some of the numbers in a second. Um, we do that by the use of standardized hardware. So many of you guys have flown things to the space station. Many of you are, are in the NASA system and, and know how it can be cumbersome to get things there. Uh, one way that we enable researchers to put things up on, up on space is to use this kind of standardized platforms. Uh, the first thing we flew was this, this box, it was a, we call it a frame, but really it was a computer, and it just had a whole bunch of USB ports. And it, we, it kind of changed the way we thought about putting experiments in space. We qualified this frame, you know, this computer, and then we didn't have to qualify the things that plugged into it. So it was a, it was a fundamental different change of, of thinking about how to put things up there. Um, got a couple pictures up here just of some of our platforms. I'll go into those a little bit more. Uh, this is one of the boring pictures. It was when I had short hair. So. Uh, our, our, ecosystem, our ecosystem in general, uh, you know, I've mentioned this, space station. Uh, because we want to just do space, or do business in space, we, we want to be commercial. We're looking at, we have other opportunities. Uh, we're flying stuff on the PSLV. Uh, we fly things on the New Shepard, the Blue Origin uh, New Shepard. Um, 
I'll talk a bit about our airlock module, which is the first commercial, truly commercial element of the space station. It's currently in fabrication. Um, and then on to space stations. So we've also partnered with some companies on uh, you know, the upcoming lunar programs and beyond, Gateway, PPE, things like that. So are you ready for it? I think this is it. Oh, no, no. Yes, it is the over-the-top statement. Check this out. So the era of commercial space stations has arrived. Okay? NanoRack is fundamentally restructuring how we look at space as a species. Repurposing on-orbit create, on creates foundation for turning all space junk into gold. So that is over the top if I've ever written anything, right? Um, so here's the thing. We believe this. So NanoRack, we believe this. And, and you guys in this room, I think, believe this too. You know, we're, we're seeing a, a change. Things are becoming commercial. Uh, big companies are moving more ag in agile ways. They're, they're following us small companies. You know, Mark spoke yesterday. We're, the, we're in the same boat. They're following us. Um, we've flown, to date, 700 payloads uh, on 34 missions from 32 nations, 220 congressional districts represented. Um, we were half of the national lab allocation to date and about 94% of the headache for NASA. So we're, we're proud of most of that. Sorry for the NASA folks in the room. But is that not over the top? I love it. Um, you have to think big. Sorry. So we do that by uh, having commercial customers. Um, I throw this list up here. You know, many people are familiar with it. I'd like to point out a couple. One is, one is NASA. Um, interesting thing that's kind of developed with our company is that NASA is a customer. Um, we found that, that in, certain, in certain areas, it's difficult for NASA to follow their own internal processes. You know, if you've flown things, you know that there's a verification process, there's a safety process, there's a, you know, the SE&I process, and uh, depending on which module you're in, there's another verification process. So we've actually had folks from NASA come to us and pay us as a commercial entity to get their thing into space. Um, one thing that I took off this slide that I used to keep up here uh, was Louis Vuitton. Uh, one of our early experiments was a really successful one. It was for a whiskey company called Ardbeg. Uh, we, we flew a terpene extraction experiment on the, on the station, and uh, their parent company is Louis Vuitton. I, I like to talk about it. I, when it was up here, it usually people would find it and always wondered if we were flying purses or something. So. So, what do we do with these customers? We have, uh, we have some platforms. So the ones that make the news the most, uh, we have satellite deployers. Um, we have our NRCSD, where we've done over 180 CubeSats off of the space station. Um, this is complementary to the, to the JAXA JSSOD. Um, we have the external Cygnus deployer. So uh, Northrop Grumman is here. Um, we, we work together to develop this program. This is, this is unique. Um, basically, we identified that this, this wonderful spaceship was just being burnt, and it, and it could be used for other things. Uh, Northrop had already thought about this at the time it was orbital um, and, and did some combustion experiments. But uh, we worked together. We got this, this deployer on there. And it's super, super interesting. Um, after the primary mission is done, you know, Cygnus goes, does its resupply mission to the space station. It goes to a higher altitude above the space station and deploys our satellites. Uh, it's unique for a number of reasons. Um, one, it gives our CubeSat customers a lot more lifetime. You know, you're, you're talking six months to a year at space station level and up to five to 10 years at that, that higher elevation. Um, another unique thing is that you're putting things in space above the space station. So it took, it took some work. Uh, it took some support of obviously our Northrop Grumman partners on this, but it took the help of NASA, Congress, international partners, things like that. So I bring that up to show that we can, as a small little company, we can really move the needle on, on programs like that. Um, so Kaber, uh, I'll jump to the bottom there. It's our Microsat deployer. Uh, it, we did something really cool lately. So we flew a satellite called the Remove Debris Satellite. And here's the first of three exciting videos. So this was built by, do I have to do anything to play it? So check this out. This is real life spider web video in space. This is made by uh, Surrey Space Systems, and this was the removed debris satellite. It spit out a CubeSat, and then it shot a net on it and caught it. It, it 
it has a series of technologies that uh, are being proven to deorbit um, space debris, and this was one of them. It was, it was successful. Used uh, some pretty interesting positioning things, some um, uh, LIDAR to track it and all that. I just think it's the coolest video ever. So, um, none of our platforms I talked about uh, are deployer, so I, I skipped over this. We, we call it the double wide. Um, I was kidding around earlier about be careful what you name something. Um, Shown here is a satellite. This is called eCamSat. And it's a great example of NASA being our customer. So this is, this is a satellite. It's a 6U form factor made by Ames Research Center. And it, it tested the replication of a certain type of E. coli bacteria in space. And it needed absolute no gravity, so just the, the best microgravity you could produce. So they built a spacecraft to do that. And, uh, and NASA came to us through. There's a couple other details to that story, but uh, they came to us. We built a deployer especially for them, and there it is. Uh, successful mission. 100% science goals attained. So some other stuff. I mentioned without stuff that's on the outside. I mentioned the terpene experiment. Uh, that was done in a mix stick. So one of the simplest things that, that we can do is basic science in space. So we, we developed this, this tube that just... Really, it goes on, on orbit, the crew manipulates it, either opens a valve, closes a valve, shakes it, something like that, and, uh, and we're able to do basic science research up there. Uh, we are able to do a terpene extract extraction experiment, for instance. But it's a hugely successful program, and it's the simplest thing you could do. It's a, it's a tube. Um, I like to bring that up because it's, uh, it's a great example of, of the, the how broad reaching science can be and how many, how many people can be involved in research in space. I mentioned 220 congressional districts. That's because each one of these mixed sticks comes from some sort of educational institute. Uh, as low as kindergarten classes are doing these mixed stick experiments. And so each one of these experiments has tons of people that are involved with it. Um, I'll blow through the rest of those. Uh, if, you, if you want. Actually, actually, kind of a fun position to be in. We have so many fun things going on on space station that uh, that I don't have time to talk all about all of them. Um, something interesting going on, and I think is going to be very relevant, and we're going to look back. Uh, we're going to look at, back at this as a real, a real turning point, tipping point for uh, space in general. We flew the first experiment to the space station by a Chinese researcher. Um, this was. It was uh, studying the microgravity effects on DNA mutation, um, and it was out of the Beijing Institute of Technology. Very successful, and, uh, and again, another one of these things where we were able to move the needle as a small company. Took a literal act of Congress to show that we weren't in violation of the Wolf Act, blah, 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 blah. Uh, this, is, this is pointing which way we're going to go, you know, more collaboration in space. All right. On to the exciting stuff. We got a couple big things going on. Um, this is a picture of the Bishop Airlock. Uh, it's, I, I hinted earlier, it's the uh, first truly commercial uh, element of the space station. Um, we are privately funding it. Um, we identified a need for, for another airlock. Uh, you know, there's the, the JAXA science airlock is used and it's oversubscribed. Um, so we, we said, well, heck, can we build another one? And the NASA folks said, yes, you can. So uh, we, went in it. We, we built a team, uh, many of you in the room, Boeing, Talus, ATA, Oceaneering, um, and, and said, OK, let's, let's do this from a truly commercial uh, point of view. We're just going to pay for this. We're not going to ask NASA for any more money. We're not going to do anything. So, so here's where we are. This is why I don't sleep very much. We are right in the middle of this, avionics delta CDR. Uh, targeting SpaceX 19, which is fall next year. So, this is a uh, you, it's a it's a big big project for any company. It's a very big project for us, and uh, we're looking forward to having it online. I'd like to show a video, and hopefully this one works. Um, this is this is what the airlock does. So, as you can see, it uses the common berthing mechanism that's already in place on on the station. It's a it's a bell jar. Once depressurized, we can do a lot of things. I'll show you some other, I'll show you another video. But you know, we, we envision being able to use it for satellite deployment. Um, it, it truly is the simplest form of airlock you could do. You know, it's just a cup, 
we call it a bell jar, um, that, that uses the space station as the, as the hatch. So, um, so it sounds simple enough, ends up being, yes, still complicated. You know, you can't just make a big metal dish. A um, bunch, of, bunch of interesting things on here. Um, we, we put two of these uh, power video grapple fixtures on there. And the reason being is that we envision being able to use this for a lot of other things. So yeah, satellite deployment is good. Uh, you know, there's always going to be a, a desire for satellite deployment. But here's another application. Because we have two things on here, we're able to grapple it, move it over to the POA. And there it goes. And once it's in place, we can, uh, we can either leave it there or we can park it there and have the arm uh, go manipulate other ORUs, put them in place, um, things like that. It's a, it just enables a lot of different uh, technologies, experiments. Uh, we're seeing a lot of interest from a lot of different researchers on this. So. So for me, this signifies a big leap for our company. Uh, and it, in a lot of ways, it, uh, it justifies what we're doing next. So we're, we're building this big piece of space hardware. And, and we're, it's for a man-rated platform, and it's a big deal for us. I used white font on purpose, so you can't really read all the details. Uh, this, this is our next big program. It's the Outpost program. Uh, we are selected for next steps. And, uh, which is, which is the NASA program to look at the next generation of space stations. And, uh, and we, we performed the first section of that. We're currently in the, the phase two something or other of uh, this experiment uh, or this, this research thing. Here's another over the top statement. Turning space junk into multi-billion dollar real estate. So the outpost program, the, the fundamental idea of it is that we are going to reuse space hardware. Uh, we, we baselined using a Centaur 5. You know, every time a, an Atlas launches, it's got a Centaur second stage. And that goes up almost all the way to the orbit and drops off its payload. And then it burns up. Um, when we started looking at this, we said, well, you know, Von Braun back in the day came up with this idea of a wet lab and, uh, and where, where you could repurpose this and you could, you could do some other stuff with it. So that's the, uh, the idea behind this, this uh, program. And uh, really, we're hoping, we're hoping we can recycle, reduce, reuse, recycle space junk. So, here's some pictures of this. I actually don't like that picture. I like this one better. Um, so it kind of shows, you know, this is a Centaur 5 upper stage um, showing this and, you know, with, with you know, really notional things, a node, a mission module, things like that. Um, Reason I like this, I, I believe in this, and I think this is all possible, is uh, there's, there's a bit of precedent. You know, Jeff, the aforementioned Jeff that uh, he's not here to defend himself, uh, did some pretty fun stuff back in the day. Um, you know, he's, he's given a lot of credit uh, for, for a lot of things, and rightfully so. Uh, in 2000, uh, he was the head of MirCorps, and you know, if you guys are familiar with this, it's an amazing story, but if you're not, you gotta look it up. Uh, you know, through a, a series of commercial government meetings, he was able to commercially fund a space flight, a human space flight, and brought two cosmonauts up to Mir. It was off, and they turned it back on and became a, you know, an active space station for 70 days. So this was, this was already a floating piece of space junk, and, uh, and he, he brought it back up. So, it was a number first. It was the first commercial spacewalk, UVA. Uh, you know, first commercial uh, like space flight, and then then it really was the uh, the full the first fully commercial uh, private human space flight uh, mission. So potential is unlimited. We've already seen some precedent for it, and I think uh, I think we're going to see a lot of really uh, exciting things come out of this program. And uh, you know. Many of you in this room are already partners on this with us, and, uh, and we're very excited about that. And uh, if you're not, look forward to working with you soon. So thank you, guys. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Got a little time for a couple of questions from the audience. Just as a reminder, we've got the, uh, the website up, so please send in your, send in your questions. 
Um, let's start with this one. So I'm just following the news today. Um, how's having a three-person crew, crew on the ISS going to affect some of your work uh, with nano NanoRacks and, and the experiments that you have going on up there? No, that's a, that's a great point. Um, so we, we rely heavily on the crew. Um, you know, we've flown a lot of experiments there, and a lot of them are very interactive. You know, I, I talked about the mix sticks. That is 100% crew interaction. Um, so, so we're very aware that a lot of our experiments and the other payload developers are going to, going to, you know, maybe have to reevaluate and only only get their primary science out of things or secondary. Um, fortunately, we've done a lot of work recently towards uh, automation and mm -hmm. and making things where we can control them from the ground. Um, one of the things that we we did a couple years ago is we built a, uh, a control room at Nanorex in Houston, and we we actually had the first and I still think the only commercial space to ground ground to space comm links. So we're we're able to talk to the crew and that's that's good. But we're also able to command all of our platforms from there. So a lot of our experiments won't be affected by a reduced crew because we'll be able to control them from the ground as we would anyway. What percentage of the, the payloads that you have up there would you say are, are need to be human tended versus even remotely tended or not tended at all even? No, it's, it's probably about half and half and okay. moving more towards automation. Um, we, we found that a lot of our experiments, a big part of that is the crew interaction. Mm -hmm. You know, I talk about having elementary school kids uh, doing an experiment. A big part of that is the astronaut comes on and says, hey guys, I'm going to do this experiment, and they get to see it happen in space while they do it in the classroom. So, right. so we, we designed some experiments to, to interact with, with the crew. Um, other ones that are doing you know, basic science like you know, plant growth or uh, you know, ferrofluids or that kind of thing, we can control, and there's no effect on that. How does that work when you do need a, a, an astronaut to tend the payload or do one of these, uh, these demonstrations with school kids? Does NanoRax pay for the time? Is that your customer? How, how do, I mean, you don't need to get into the nitty gritty, but how does that work? <laughs> no, so it's included in the price, so I'll say okay. that. Um, when, so we, we operate under a Space Act agreement, which uh, our, anyone can have, uh, which is when, when NASA finished the space station, they realized they needed to use it. And so I said, well, okay, well, let's, let's first designate this a national lab, and then let's create a pathway for, for mm -hmm. users to to access this. And so we were one of the first people to get one of these space acts, and included in that space act is the ability to barter for, for crew time. Okay. So uh, when, when the uh, crew interacts with it, it's all done through operational procedures, and I have a, I have a team of ops engineers that, that create those documents and work closely with Huntsville. So obviously uh, a lot of the, the current or uh, existing success that you have with NanoRacks is on the ISS uh, and on Blue Origin's New Shepard. Blue Origin, uh, yes, Shameless plug. Um, <laughs> what, uh, you showed us your, your, uh, one of your uh, next pieces of hardware that you're developing. What are you thinking about in terms of deep space exploration? Are you thinking about being part of some of the lunar plans that are being discussed or Martian plans? What, what, what's next for, yes. for NanoRacks? So I guess the, the Simple way to say it is we want to be a part of everything. We, uh, we at our core, are uh, almost a real estate company. You know, we, we, have, we have technologies that, that we own and develop and, and innovative things that way, but really our strengths lie in the utilization of things that already exist. So we, we're partnered with uh, uh, Moon Express on, on the lunar, uh, the lunar uh, endeavors. We're partnering with teams on the, the gateway and, uh, and really, we're just looking to piggyback on and, and find every little spot where we can use it for commercial. Why do you think NanoRacks has been as successful as they have been? And effectively, and correct me if I'm wrong, basically a, a player without much competition. Uh, a number of reasons. Uh, one, we're, we've been self-funded from the start. So we never, we never took risks that we, uh, we weren't willing to take. Uh, they, Jeff always makes a joke that our, our first funders were MasterCard and Visa. Um, <laughs> the uh, second reason is we had a lot of support, and we still have a lot of support from NASA. Um, it's, it's interesting, you know, when it became National Lab and the, the OZ group at NASA was, was uh, really brought up, they wanted us to succeed. And interestingly, they want us to succeed so much that we create an environment that competes with ourselves. And we're, and we're seeing that now, which is, which is great. I think that 
I welcome all competition there. I think it'd be fantastic if every flight was packed full of science. So. Well, you also have a very good team. Obviously, uh, Jeff's background definitely got you through a, I mean, it's not a, a you know, it's an institutional yeah. knowledge hurdle, right? It is. No, and, and you're right. The, a lot of this stuff is done by visionaries like Jeff, visionaries there in this room. Like, it takes, it takes uh, you know, a couple people just really push the limits always to keep it going. How do you, uh, how do you work with cases? Obviously, there are another group that's here yep. to open up space. Uh, very well. So uh, CASIS is the, uh, for those who don't know, it's the Center for Advancements of Science advancement of science and space. It's the, uh, the quasi-governmental group that, that maintains the, uh, the allocation of the National Lab for, for the space station. So obviously we work with them quite a bit. Um, we're, we're over half of their payload, and we have been from the start, so we've always had a great relationship with them. Great. So um, things seem to be so rosy. What are, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, space is hard. It's not always so smooth. Yeah. What, what are some of the, the challenges that you have? I mean, I'm sure you're the CTO. There's a lot of technical issues that keep you up at night. If Jeff were here, what would you say? What would he say some of the, the broader business challenges that you have? So everybody in the room can probably sympathize. Like when, when something doesn't go well, uh, and then you have to, then you realize that you were doing things wrong the whole time. Um, I, I like to tell a story. We, uh, we flew this experiment, and this is for, it was an educational, we were going to make these kits, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I was tasked with come up with the simplest idea you can, right? Okay, something that for sure is going to work so we can have this first kit be really simple. And I said, okay, well, let's do, let's do uh, sugar crystals, right? We know that that works. You mm -hmm. go to any truck stop anywhere, there's rock candy. So, okay, we're going to grow sugar crystals in space. And got it all together, did thousands of tests on the ground, got it, got everything right. We're going to use crew water and all this stuff. It's really exciting. We get it up there. They go to do the experiment. And guess what? No crystals. Doesn't crystallize. Yeah, it. no crystals at all. And suddenly it's like, well, all right, I feel a little dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it, you know, the silver lining there is you go, well, holy cow, there's a lot of stuff we really don't know. And maybe some of the stuff that's working, we, it, it's working for the wrong reasons. We don't understand it fully. So it, it reinforced the fact to me that, that we need to uh, emphasize basic science. We need to have just high, in, in research, in the research world, it's high in. You know, we, need a lot of, we need a lot of experiments to happen. And, uh, and so we can nail down things like that. So. Great. Um, so you're outside airlock. Yeah. Very cool. Very, very cool. Um, are you going to, obviously you're talking about uh, deployment of small sats. Do you have, uh, are you gonna offer some way to do experiments that have exposure? What, what, are, what yes. are some other uses of this? So the airlock's great because it, it, it provides a lot of real estate, um, both inside and outside. So in its, in its docked form, it can be used as a, as a place to store racks. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a space problem uh, mm -hmm. on, on the station. Uh, so it provides volume. Um, when it's outside, uh, it can be used for satellite deployments uh, or, or exposure experiments. You can point at Zenith Nader. You can use it for, for that. Great part about it, and I didn't mention in the, in the talk there, is that we also have external sites. So we, have the, we use the Oceaneering Gold 2 connector instead of FRAMS, and we have six hosted sites so we can have you know, ORU experiments out there. So lots Great. of fun stuff. Very cool. And then last question for you. So uh, International Space Station, um, it's great that you're reaching out to other countries. Interesting to see that you had a Chinese payload. Yeah. Just curious, what, what did that take to, to get that up there? So it was difficult. Um, you know, there's, there's always been hesitancy and there's specific acts in place against you know, certain countries accessing it. Um, it took, and the, the, the biggest thing it took was a very good researcher. Uh, world-renowned DNA RNA researcher out of the Beijing, Beijing Institute of Technology, Dr. Feng. Um, so he was a legitimate scientist, so it was wonderful. Um, second was the, the experiment had to have a, you know, a publishable outcome. It, like all of our experiments, they have to have a science research educational mm -hmm. component to it. Third was I couldn't plug it into the internet. So, you know, if there was a private Wi-Fi thing. So, to get around that, kind of did a creative, a creative thing. I could monitor the power that it was drawing, 
And so in the different phases of the experiment, between that, I had it just do a super high power draw. And so based on that, it was kind of sending us Morse code to see oh, okay. what part of the experiment was going. So if it did good, it gave us two dots. Yeah. If it did bad, it did three. So Very it was interesting. creative. Yeah. Great. Excellent. So yeah, uh, uh, political but also technical challenges look, look like you had to deal with both. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Um, in any case, Mike, thanks so much for your time. Thank you very A round much. of applause. Thank you guys. Thank you.